Uh, on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture in our year-long series on ethical issues in end-of-life care. Um, today's talk, as you know, is the first talk of the spring quarter. Um, next Wednesday, on April 8th, uh, Dr. Diane Meyer from New York will speak on uh, improving quality reduces costs, ethical aspects of care for the seriously ill. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Savitri Fetzen. Dr. Fetzen is an associate professor of medicine. Um, uh, she's a cardiologist who specializes in heart failure and heart transplantation. Uh, Savi is part of a team of medical and surgical specialists who provide a full range of treatment options, including LVADs, to improve heart pumping ability in patients with heart failure. If transplantation is required, Dr. Fetzen cares for such patients uh, before and after the transplant to ensure the best outcome. Dr. Fetzen is actively researching comparisons between invasive and non-invasive hemodynamic measurements and heart failure prevention. Dr. Fetzen received her MD from the University of Virginia before completing residencies here at the University of Chicago and at Cook County Hospital and a cardiology fellowship at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Fetzen also completed um, an ethics fellowship uh, at the McLean Center in 2008 and 2009. Today, Dr. Fetzen will speak to us on the topic, Ethical Issues in Discontinuing LVADs. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Savi Fetzen. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here as part of the symposium this year on end-of-life care. And um, I hope to, to enlighten you a little bit not only on how to perhaps die with mechanical circulatory support, but also the indications for um, MCS as it may be something not all of you are familiar with. Um, I do not have any uh, disclosures. I will be discussing in one of my cases off-label use of ventricular assist devices. And as Mark has mentioned, I am a transplant and bad cardiologist. So I guess that is fundamentally uh, uh, at least an influence, not a conflict, but an influence of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so as MCS is really not something which is discussed really much outside the realm of advanced heart failure. I'm going to bring people up to speed, just to, so permit me a little bit of history for MCS and indications for MCS to put things in a proper frame of reference. This is just a brief slide of the history of, of circulatory support. Um, mechanical circulatory support is now about 60 years old. Um, if you go back to the original cardiopulmonary bypass in 1953, I think many people, of course, are familiar with Louis Washinowski, who was the first transplant recipient in 19. Uh, 67. What people are less familiar with was that was the, also the same year MCS was used as a bridge to transplant. So even though it's something that really has only come to the fore and come to be part of mainstream medicine perhaps the last 10 years, again, uh, 40 plus years ago, it was, uh, it was first used and tried. The biggest thing which really has influenced the development of, card of mechanical circulatory support, so MCS, was really in 1964 when the NIH uh, really started its artificial heart program. Now, when we think about MCS, uh, these are all of the durable LVAD. So I'm going to use MCS and LVAD. MCS is mechanical circulatory support. LVAD is left ventricular assist device. I, I will use them somewhat interchangeably, although they are not. Um, what we are really talking about, or what I'm going to be talking about today, is durable LVADs. So LVADs that are designed to last for a long period of time uh, to go home with a patient. And these are really the devices sort of on the bottom half of the slide. So these are devices which really have only been in play about 20 years, which is why the, the field of discussion about how to approach patients with LVADs, how to talk about turning things off or on, is really in, in its infancy comparative to other uh, fields, and certainly in, in medical ethics and surgical ethics. Now, who needs an LVAD? So it's a sort of big question, um, probably a billion dollar question. Um, to put things in perspective, there are about four, uh, five to six billion people in the US with heart failure. Um, heart failure 
of all types, whether it's reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, account for about $40 billion of healthcare expenditure a year. Um, heart failure is a leading DRG for the Medicare population as far as hospitalizations. It, if you take all of those people with heart failure, those who have reduced ejection heart failure is about 50% of those, and about 400,000 of those. So a relatively small percentage are people who are going to be stage D heart failure. So those people in whom we would think about advanced options, such as mechanical circulatory support, transplant, or also equally as acceptable, palliative care in other means, or hospice care. So it's about 400,000 people a year who would be eligible for us to consider these types of therapies. Why is this important? I'm sorry, that's a little bit blurry. This is a, a cartoon which has been published in a variety of forms looking at the trajectory of heart failure. And unlike uh, other conditions which are uh, terminal conditions, as is advanced heart failure, what you have is a clinical course which could be steady, and then you start having these undulations and decrease in care. So what we try and do for advanced heart failure is intervene at some point there and break the, the sort of downward cycle and, and the repetitive ebbs and flows of symptoms. And we could either think about transplant, where we restore some degree of normalcy, um, mechanical support here, continuous inotropes or other forms of strict palliation, or MCS with complications. So of course, I'm talking here about mechanical circulatory support and MCS with complications. Those are the, the people in whom, of course, we're talking about today. What are the indications for an LVAD, just to put things in perspective, so you know what the type of people we're talking about when we're talking about stopping a therapy, who could have actually been um, able to get a therapy. These are class four heart failure patients who have been unresponsive to optimal medical therapy for at least, this is the CMS, I should say, this is the CMS definition of what they'll pay for. These are the guidelines we use clinically. Um, so unresponsive to medical therapy for at least two out of the last three months people who have decreased ejection fraction less than 25%, um, functional limitation less than, um, this is based on a cardiopulmonary stress test of less than 12 mils per kilo per minute, or who are inotrope dependent, so chronic dobutamine or melanone therapy, and have an appropriate body size. These devices are big, so a very small person is not suitable for many of these devices that have been out there. Newer ones are coming just strictly because we can't wedge it all in the same thoracic space. They could be implanted either as destination therapy, meaning that this is the one option we have for them. Their LVAD will be their therapy. We have no plans to change it out for transplant down the road. We have no plans for other therapy. This is, this is the ultimate, the end of the road for them as far as what we could offer them aggressively. So that's DT. There is bridge to transplantation, BTT where our ultimate goal would be to support someone long enough with these devices to ultimately give them an organ when an organ became available. There is, in lighter gray, bridge to consideration, which is not a clear indication, but which is something we, we practice all the time, where we aren't quite sure what's going to happen to the patient. So we're going to bridge them to something. Um, and we may bridge them to transplant, or they may end up being a destination therapy candidate if things change, or if, if things don't pan out as we hope. And then in, in much, much less frequent, frequently, about 1% of the time, 2% of the time, we could put these in as a bridge to recovery, where someone's heart function will recover after an acute illness, acute stunning, and we're able to explant these patients. I'm not including these in this group of patients because that happens so infrequently and is not really the, the bulk of what MCS care is about. So the terminology I'll use are DT or BTT. Again, I'm really talking about DT destination therapy patients here. And then there are the types of LVADs that we have to think about. And, and I'm specifying LVADs because LVADs are really where most of the, the research has been. Most of the implants are really to support the left ventricle. We can infrequently support the right ventricle in an isolated form, but it really is the LVAD world that all of this has grown up in. And there are durable LVADs. So these are LVADs that we expect a great deal of longevity. We expect years of life. Um, years of normal functioning with them. People, we expect them to be ambulatory, we expect them to be at home. The other type would be a temporary LVAD. Um, people can be ambulatory with these. They tend to be in hospital, and they're meant for short-term periods of support. So there are two types of MCS or LVADs that we have to keep into consideration. Just to give you a visual of what these are, because many of you may not be familiar with what they are, on the 
left side of the slide are uh, the two examples of some temporary LVEDs I can see. And the top one is the tandem heart. This is put in in the cath lab. Um, with this, because of the, the way in which it's positioned, patients are obligatorily bed bound for this. So clearly, this would be a non ambulatory support. The bottom one, even though it's a very large platform, is a uh, centromag, which is, can be put in, in the cath lab or uh, surgically. People can ambulate with these. I mean, you're ambulating with a huge console, but people can walk with these devices. They're designed to be short term, weeks to maybe a few months at most if you push the envelope. On the right side of the slide are, are conventional VADs that we think about. This is the HeartMate 2, and this is the Heartware HVAD. There are two different uh, types of devices. These are the most common ones uh, that are now implanted. There are newer ones certainly down the pipeline and in trials. Um, and they are smaller uh, compared to the older LVADs. And that, that, comes in, that becomes important when we talk about some of the, the sparse data out there about beliefs and opinions about turning off LVADs. Um, the year of life support can be lengthy. The longest person with a HeartMate 2 LVAD right now is going on nine years of supportive therapy at home. So a very good uh, duration of longevity of good quality of life. Longer battery lives. Batteries can keep people um, out of the house for up to 12 hours. So it does really restore a good quality of life. So that's just a little bit briefly to, to bring everyone up to at least some level of speed about LVADs when we talk about turning them off or how to die with an LVAD in place. The other thing to realize is when we talk about putting in LVADs, there's something called the Intermax score. The Intermax is a registry, uh, it's an interagency registry for mechanical assisted circulatory support. It is, um, it is in some ways a voluntary registry, but most centers that um, implant LVADs participate in it. And it's, it's a way that we as a, as a VAD community are tracking the appropriate time to put in, in VADs with patients. And so you will see when we talk about patients what level of shock they are. Realizing that the best of these patients, which is an Intermax 7, are the New York Heart Association 3B. These are people who get breathless with fairly minimal exertion. So if you take that as the best of the possibilities in this Intermax score, we go there to progressively worse, where if you look at, let's say, Intermax 4, they're frequent flyer, meaning recurrent um, readmissions, um, and we expect their survival to be weeks to months. So that we expect their survival, of, unless we intervened, to be in the order of months. They would certainly, we would expect them to be dead by a year. And if you go back to the original rematch data, which I'm not, um, which I'm not showing you, looking at the difference between the first generation of durable LVADs and optimal medical therapy, at one year, you had 25% survival in the medical management arm. At two years, you had 8% survival at two years. So medical therapy in these groups of patients, 8% survival at two years. Worse than most solid tumors. So this is the group of people we're talking about. If we look at the people who are intermax 3, 2, and 1 progressively, we expect them to live days, weeks, or even hours before we intervene. So we're, generally speaking, talking about a very sick population that we're trying to support. Now, with an LVAD, you get the good. Um, and LVADs have, have an opportunity, unlike many aggressive therapies which are instituted when people are critically ill, um, and I, I don't really want to use the word end of life because if we did not do something for these heart failure patients, it would be the end of life. Um, however, because of an LVAD and, and what we're able to do, we could actually restore life um, in a manner of speaking so that we can give people a longevity without addressing their underlying heart disease, but we could give them you know, longevity and restore and perhaps sort of blind ourselves to the fact that underlying they still do have severe heart failure. So LVADs do give a good quality of life. These are data that were published um, looking at the real world data of LVAD implants. So taking away the trials and the perfect clinical situation of someone calling you to make sure everything's following up. But if you look at the, the real life data of LVAD implants, this is quality of life data that were published in 2010. And if you look at it on the, on the top you have green is good. So progressively as you have longer implantation, you have more people going to a New York Heart Association class one, essentially asymptomatic with normal exertion, where previously they had all been New York Heart Association class four. So we can improve their functional quality of life. Over here you have six minute walk distance. So people can actually walk 
the equivalent increase of three lengths of a football field with LVAD therapy. So it's a meaningful quality and restoration of life. Um, and I just want to have the caveat that these are all, all implants, so people who are implanted as a bridge to transplant as, as destination. Fewer than, or roughly 50% of those who are implanted as a bridge are actually ultimately transplanted. So while it is, it is certainly our intent, there are many people who we implant as bridge who become by default or become a sort of by criteria destination candidates. So this is the good. You have the bad. Um, so with, bad, with LVADs, there can be an ant anticipated complications. We absolutely know that there are complications that will happen with an LVAD. Those are bleeding, very commonly. They could be, and it could be fairly debilitating. You can imagine an intracranial bleed is fairly debilitating. GI bleeding can be profound, can be repetitive, can be exhaustive for the patients and for our GI colleagues who have to help us manage them. Epistaxis, people can have profound epistaxis, which is difficult to control, and GU bleeding. So bleeding, we know, can happen. You could have thrombosis of an LVAD. You could have hemolysis of an LVAD. Um, you could get infections. You could get driveline infections. All of these um, devices have some component where you cross the skin. There's a barrier across the skin so that you have some portal of entry into the patient's body from the external world. And then you could have recurrent heart failure symptoms. So we know that these will happen. How frequently will they happen? If you look at the, the on the top with the, the line plot here, these are months after discharge and reasons for hospitalizations. And you could, and this is, the, the scale is a little off, it's readmissions per patient. Um, so if you add it all up together, there are a number of uh, admissions per patients, but people are readmitted for psychosocial reasons, for cardiac diseases, uh, for infections, and for non-cardiac comorbidities, the greatest of those is GI bleeding. If you look at the bar plot on the bottom, it shows you the 30% of the admission, readmissions are for, this is cardiac, 30% are for bleeding. This is not a benign treatment we're giving people, um, followed by 20% for infection. So we know that these, these complications are going to happen, and it's more, more than on the order of 1% to 2%. This is, you know, a third of patients will have these complications. Up front, we know that. So when we talk about MCS, we have to think about who's going to get them. So how do we think about it? First of all, not everyone has accessibility to VAD centers. There's a huge part in the West, if you take Montana, Idaho, those, those regions where you don't have VAD centers. It's hard to get an LVAD if you live in those. If you talk about some places in the South, there are pockets where it's hard to get an LVAD. So not every one of the 400,000 patients has equal accessibility to an LVAD center. Absolutely. That goes the same with transplant centers. So people who are going to be implanted as an LVAD, perhaps is it because they just don't have access to a transplant center? And perhaps if we had equal access to all transplant centers, that might be a more appropriate therapy. So certainly in the selection process of who gets an LVAD, there is some inequity. What about age? How old is too old to get an LVAD? How young is too young to get an LVAD? Because interestingly, some complications such as infection are greater in the younger population than the older population. So if you look at who might benefit more, it's sort of a toss-up. So what is the right age? There is a certain amount, actually a great deal, of patient VAD interaction that has to take place. Unlike many other devices and many other therapies that we, we offer to patients, the patient has to be directly involved with care of their VAD on a day-to-day -day basis. You cannot forget that you have an LVAD. I think it, it probably would be easy to forget that you have a pacemaker. It may be less easy to forget that you have an ICD if you've ever had a shock, but if you've never had a shock, you could probably forget that you have an ICD. You can't forget you have an LVAD. So there's a lot of interaction that you have to have. There's a lot of cognitive awareness that you have to have in order to t take care and do self-care in your LVAD therapy. So mental age, developmental delay become important. How about comorbidities? Cancer? What type of cancer? Chronic infections, HIV, hep C, now curable? Hep B, renal failure. Renal failure is interesting because there are many centers who will not consider a destination VAD in someone who is on dialysis. So in and of itself, that's an exclusion in many centers. So again, we exclude people up front saying that they don't meet the criteria for appropriate therapies with an LVAD. And then you talk about who can best use a pump, um, who best tolerates a pump. 
Men tolerate it differently than women. Women tend to have more intracranial bleeds than men do. Is there something we need to go when we talk about who should have a pump? And so ultimately, we're, we're really allowing patients to survive from their cardiac disease, which otherwise would have killed them, to then start experiencing their other disabilities. We are setting them up to not feel good in some ways while restoring their life because they could get arthritis, they could have progression of their cancer. All of these things have to be taken into consideration. But how much do we need to have it in there when we talk about implantation events? So I could overwhelm a patient and scare a patient to death, no pun intended, talking about an LVAD and how bad I could make them and not focus on how good I could make them. Now, if we look at survival, again, the, what I mentioned earlier was the, the rematch trial here, and this is the 8% two-year survival. LVADs really let people live a long time. And if, if you take the modern-day era of VADs and in the real-life population, you now have, you've taken mortality from 92% mortality to 30% mortality at two years, meaning 70% survival at two years after LVAD implant. We are giving these patients a good chance at a good quality of life. What makes MCS unique, though, when we talk about advanced and aggressive end-of-life care or options for terminal heart failure? We talk about consent. You know, autonomy of, of personhood and agency is really the, the, the underpinning of, of consent when we try and get informed consent. Heart failure is fraught with difficulty right off the bat because heart failure imposes on people a certain amount of cognitive impairment. Um, cognitive impairment, predominantly uh, based on work done by one of our um, nurse practitioners here in the executive functioning and visual spatial domains. So the ability to sort of executively track things, make decisions, awareness of one's own limitation is impaired in heart failure, and also visual spatial. So you could imagine connecting a battery to a drive line. That type of, that type of coordination is impaired more preferentially in heart failure than other types of executive functioning. So how can we accurately inform our patients up front of the risks they're going to have later? I mean, all procedures are, are, have some inherent flaw in this, but I think heart failure does have a, a little bit different. And we're trying to set them up to exchange one set of medical problems, that of breathlessness, that of fatigue, that of orthopnea, VT, for another set of problems. A patient did describe it as life with a toaster. How do you tell someone what life with a toaster is going to be like? Um, it's amazing how many people you discover really love swimming when you start talking about VADs because it's the one thing that they can't really do. Um, and there are a number of people out there who that's the only exercise they ever like to do, and now you're telling them they can't do it uh, once they get a durable LVAD. Now, the implantation of VADs is often urgent and life-saving. Someone comes in and in or max one or, you know, where they have days to weeks to live. They're crashing and burning. We're going to have to put in an LVAD to save their life. You don't have time to have all these discussions. And normally when we think about intervening in the setting of acute medical illness like that, we're, think, we're talking about intervening on things where if we decide to discontinue, the ramifications are very different. So if you intubate someone for mechanical ventilation, that's fairly benign compared to the process of sending someone to the operating room for an LVAD. If you think about putting in a catheter for dialysis, again, fairly benign in the setting of putting someone either in the cath lab for a catheter-based LVAD or to an operating room. So the scale of, of intervention that we're proposing is very, very different. I would say, though, because we do have the ability to put some of the temporary MCS in the cath lab, that changes a little bit. So we can send someone to the cath lab and put them on a central mag, put them on ECMO even in the cath lab without having to do open-heart surgery. So we're able to get people to very aggressive therapies in a, in a less aggressive way, I should say. Um, so it, it may equate, you know, or equalize the balance somewhat. But then you're dealing with the surrogate. And most patients and family members certainly are not familiar with LVAD technology. Very few physicians talk about it unless you're an advanced heart failure physician. So there's not a lot of general understanding of what life is like with a VAD, how things work, the pros and cons of having an LVAD. In that, in that setting. And the implications of durable LVAD technology for the patient is more complex because of the direct interaction. Um, so having primary consent in this case is, some, is crucial. I will not advocate for putting in a durable LVAD, meaning a long-term LVAD in a patient, unless that patient tells me 
they want it. Because I don't care what their surrogate says, that surrogate isn't going to have to live with the toaster and have to do all the manipulations themselves. So having primary consent is absolutely crucial for an LVAD, and we often don't have the ability to do it up front. And I, there, have been, there have been a number of, of papers written about this. The Baylor group actually does a lot of work in LVAD. Um, the ethics group at ba Baylor does a lot of work in LVAD decision making. And, and there is a lot of in, increased awareness about the, necessary, the necessity of primary consent because people then change, the patients then change their mind or make up their mind having never given it in the first place months after the device has been implanted. So should we just say yes? Should we just say yes? You know, if someone's crashing, let's put them in. So with LVADs as DT, it's not curative. We are not changing their underlying pathology. We are masking it. We are making it unnecessary. We are taking over the heart function. We are giving them five liters of flow, which is certainly enough to sustain everything. So should we just say we're going to do this? It's interesting, a lot of the studies looking at decision making at end of life care and heart failure have really looked at the time trade off and looking at quality of life. And for many heart failure patients, and this is work that's really been beautifully done by Eldrin Lewis at the Brigham, looking at decisions about quality of life. And because an LVAD necessarily changes your day to day life, it can improve your quality of life tremendously. But for a certain period of time after you have an LVAD, you can't take a shower. We encourage bathing, but you can't take a shower. You can't sit in a hot tub. You can't go swimming. Aside from that, you could pretty much do everything we, we encourage, normal life. But certainly, it does affect your activities of day-to-day -day living. The other thing, which I, I sort of hesitate to say, but truly, as, as a, when we think about it as a community of LVAD doctors, we do have to think about the economic implications of it. There are countries in which destination therapy LVADs are not offered because of the economic consequences of destination therapy for LVADs. If we think about ne uh, necessitating primary consent for durable LVAD therapy, we're talking about putting in a temporary device, letting the patient wake up, clear their sensorium, have a conversation, then implanting them with a destination therapy. The hospital will get reimbursed for one LVAD and you've given them two. So it's, it's a huge economic consideration to consider. I think it's worth it to make sure that we make the right choice for the patient. But these are all of the considerations that have to, have to go into the discussion of who actually gets an LVAD. And LVADs are palliative care. They're an aggressive, incredibly expensive, costly, burdensome form of palliative care. But they are a wonderful of palliative care. And I, I love this phrase, which was published um, out of Britain, actually, in 2007, which is it can improve the short, wretched lives of people. And it absolutely can. But it also has great um, potential for complications. It pays, places great stress on caregivers and support. Up to 25% of caregivers report PTSD associated with LVADs. So it's the support network that is involved is incredibly burdensome for family members. And I don't think even when a surrogate is making, trying to make decisions, they're aware of the burden to themselves that they will incur with that. And it's, I mean, it's interesting. It's, uh, this is an article now, I guess, four years ago from the New York Times looking at, you know, when is it appropriate to tell people to stop? You know, and they, they were doing this in the context of dialysis. Um, but when it comes to an economic burden to society and to an individual family, these are very important decisions. So futility. So if we're talking about how to die with an LVAD or MCS, futility often comes up. At what point is something futile? Um, advanced technologies are, are, are absolutely appropriate and justified when there's clinical benefit. But what happens when this changes? What happens when there's no longer clinical benefit? And in the setting of LVAD, what criteria means that there's no clinical benefit? Remember, it restores symptoms. It prolongs life. It does not cure the underlying disease. They still have heart failure. They may still even have VT. They may even have VF and be walking around in VF with an LVAD. That absolutely happens. So we are not taking away their disease at all. And we all, I think, would agree that when care is futile, we don't need to continue it. But if the futility is not related to the pump, but other thing else, patients may not be able to die. We can keep their heart going, heart going, as long as we have an electrical power source to it. So how, how, do, you, how do you navigate that, that pathway? And 
there is, I think, a, a consensus, I would hope, that um, therapies that prolong life but do not reverse the medical conditions can be, can be withdrawn. And there's very good moral and ethical groundwork case law to support those decisions. Um, we certainly do that with hemodialysis. We do it with mechanical ventilation. We even do it with insulin and diabetics when it becomes burdensome to check their glucose. But when should we talk about it? That becomes part of the, the case or the discussion of this. When should we talk about these things? Jim Kirkpatrick, when he was here as a cardiology fellow, um, we did a study together. And Jim has now gone on, and he works very closely with the ethics group at Penn and has written on deactivation of, of devices in cardiac patients. Um, he's a cardiologist. He's an echocardiographer. Um, but we did a study in patients in our own CCU here. And we compared it to the oncology floor, because oncology is really where we think a lot about advanced directives. And there's, there's been certainly a historic um, network and organization to talk about end-of-life care, palliative care, hospice care. We're behind in cardiology. And so we looked at our own group of patients in the CCU. And amazingly, the vast majority of them in the green wanted more information about palliative care and advanced care. Very few patients said, no, I don't want to hear about it. And I'm sort of embarrassed to say that some of these patients were heart transplant patients who had already faced death once, and apparently we had neglected to talk to them about it. People had already had VF and VT. They'd already died. And they'd been brought back, and we still hadn't brought up advanced care directives with them. So in cardiology, at least eight years ago, we'd not been doing a very good job. But comparing it to the hemonc floor here, again, same institution, same period of time, it was interesting because it was absolutely the opposite on the hemonc floor. People didn't want to know more. People didn't want to discuss the mortality. So certainly in cardiology, there is this, this need for patients who I think are aware of this, of the aspect of the fact that you know, heart failure is, is a terminal disease. They wanted more discussion about it. So how does it approach them? So this is an example of patients' experience of turning off cardiac devices. And this is just, this is, again, a pacemaker or defibrillator. Something which you don't have to interact with every day. You don't have to change a battery. You don't have to change a dressing. It's in you. And I think the, the accepted practice now is if someone is getting paced and they're end of life, we will keep it on if, if it's sort of more for palliative, if we're entering comfort care, palliative care, we may keep it on because it's not burdensome. If people get shocks, that can be burdensome. We'll turn off therapies from a defibrillator, for example. But if you ask patients what they, or how they feel about it, this was, I mean, a small study, 15 outpatients. Two had had the device for greater than a year, had never gotten a shock. Eight had had it for greater than a year and had gotten a shock. And five had had it less than a year and had never gotten a shock. So you have, you know, seven patients who had never gotten a shock, eight patients who had gotten a shock. Appropriate shock, meaning it saved their life. It brought them back from sudden cardiac death. None had ever discussed the activation of the ICD as a possibility, either time of implant or anything else. And they, they, the vast majority felt that turning off therapies, even if they'd never gotten one, was an act of suicide. So their own experience of how to turn off a device, which is essentially there as an insurance policy, was similar to committing an act of suicide. So patients feel very, have, have very strong views about turning off device therapies. I mean, this is, again, a very small study, but this, is, this has been replicated in other studies. But with an, with an LVAD, it's, it's, it's support, but it's restoring a quality of life. Um, this is a quote from one of our patients who, um, when I first met pre-LVAD, I walked into his room and he said, you are here to bring life into my happiness, and I'm here to bring happiness into your life. And he has done that. Um, and he's had, he has had an LVAD now, and he's was admitted numerous times with GI bleeding um, and has had complications of having to have a pump exchanged. I mean, he's not had, he's had the typical course of problems. But this is his attitude about, you know, I, I want to live. And he is with an LVAD. They're restorative. Um, but what do we do about it? And turning off an LVAD is different than turning off a defibrillator. It's different than turning off a pacemaker. Um, turning off an LVAD often results in imminent death. And there, there have been a number of, of papers out there talking about what it means. And it, it really, actually, the European and the American views are, are actually quite dissimilar 
uh, in this respect, and that many, many more of our European colleagues actually think of turning off an LVAD perhaps more as either euthanasia or physician-assisted death, as opposed to an act where the primary intention is not death, but the primary intention is to stop what is now a futile therapy. So there's very discussion, and there are, there are people here who have been involved in turning off an LVAD who still have flashbacks where they're trying to figure out, did they kill someone by turning off an LVAD? Because when you, it's, it's a very direct, or it can be a very direct event. Um, similar, for example, to withdrawing mechanical ventilation on someone who is vent dependent. I mean, we in medicine certainly do things all the time, which we know the next series of actions will lead to the patient expiring of whatever their underlying disease is. That has to be remembered with an LVAD, they are dying of their underlying heart disease. They aren't dying because we turn the LVAD off. They're dying because their EF was 5% to begin with, and I haven't made it better. But what do we know about it? What do we know about how patients feel? So this is a paper, actually, Dan Salmazy was part of about five years ago. Um, there are actually, interestingly, have only been about three or four papers looking at the opinions about turning off an LVAD. And so this was a, this was a um, group of patients that were implanted at the Mayo Clinic, and it was a... 2003 to 2009, so just be aware, it's in both the older and the newer generations of devices. The older generations of devices were bulkier, had less incidence of bleeding, but were more, in some ways, um, some of them were noisier. You could actually hear them. You'd hear it. So you, you were constantly be aware of the sound of it. Um, and they also um, had a, a much shorter duration of time. The older devices, for example, might only last two years not the seven to nine years we routinely expect these days. And in this group of patients, um, there were 26 who died, 14 had surrogates, or they themselves, and those are the two highlighted, requested the device be turned off. And if you look at what caused them to request this, it's, it's really not the VAD. The VAD was functioning, but it's hemorrhage, which we know happens, multi-system organ failure, and it didn't specify whether it was progressive renal failure, liver failure, respiratory failure, any combination of the above. Cardiac arrest, CHF, so progressive heart failure, absolutely. This is someone, and the cardiac arrest are the people who actually were able to say for themselves they wanted to have a VAD turned off. Cancer, multi-system organ failure. So these are the things that prompted patients to say, let's turn the LVAD off. In a slightly more contemporary uh, study, this is a study out of Utah, um, there are 92 destination VADs in 69 patients. You do the math, but clearly some patients had more than one VAD. Right. Um, and these are, again, patients who were actually implanted as part of the original destination trial. So the XV and the Novacor, these are larger, bulkier pumps. These are pumps that did not have a long duration. For example, the HeartMate XV routinely would start having mechanical failure at about 18 months. So these are devices we knew up front were not going to last a long period of time. And this is a study that asked three questions of, of caregivers of patients. Um, was there an event or a series of events that prompted the decision to discuss withdrawal? How was that discussion reached? And was there sufficient support for the family? So this is really looking at the caregiver support and burden of these. Um, 20 of these patients actively engaged, or their surrogates actively engaged in the end-of-life decision. Interestingly, the mean age was 67, but clearly with a 23-year-old in there, you had, you had young people in there. So maybe people who had cancers who were put in the who had a DT VAD, let's say, for adriamycin-related cardiomyopathy. So not just an elderly population, certainly a young population. Um, they'd had the VAD for a period of time. You know, they'd had the VAD for over two years, the mean duration of support. Um, of these 20 patients, most died at home. Some died in the hospital. 17 of them turned the device off. Only three of them turned the device off after they became unconscious. So they allowed, if they had a CNS bleed, for example, they would allow the CNS bleed to progress till unconsciousness, and then they would decide to deactivate. What were the events that prompted the discussion about termination of care turning off the LVAD? Again, what we would expect, infection sepsis, driveline infection leading to bacteremia, strokes, cancer, uh, renal failure, and impending pump failure. And the decision to discontinue um, from the decision made to the time, or discussion begun to the time of discontinuation was between one and 14 days. So it happened very quickly. So these are events that happened really at the end of life and had not done, been done beforehand. So the 
the question comes of when the indication changes, when we put in a VAT and, and the indication for which we put it in changes, when do we start talking about how to turn it off? So if you are implanted as a bridge to transplant and now you are no longer a transplant candidate, is that sufficient to say, it's appropriate now to talk about discontinuing the LVAD? If, if it was implanted to you as a bridge to transplant, you are not a transplant cancer, uh, candidate, let's say you've had it for five years and your cancer has recurred. We typically wait five years after solid tumors before thinking about transplant. Is that sufficient to say, it's appropriate to say, let's withdraw care? Or because it's a, it restores life and is such a good palliative care agent, is ongoing endeavor for quality of life, and as long as there's quality of life, we should say, no, 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 let's persist and let's forge forward. It's variable with an LVAD. There's not a right or wrong answer. But it would certainly be, you could certainly have a rational person say, I'm not a transplant candidate. Five years with my LVAD, I'm not a transplant candidate. I will never be. I don't want it anymore. A rational person could make that decision. And the goal, the indication has changed. And it is ultimately a form of palliative care in that event. So these are decisions that have to be addressed with patients. So when is it appropriate to discontinue or to discuss discontinuation? Especially because turning off an LVAD could make you worse. Turning off an ICD therapy will not make you worse. Most people don't feel better with an ICD. Turning it off does not make them feel worse. Turning off an LVAD can make you worse because leaving a turned off LVAD, um, which there is a power switch on off button. You could turn it off with an accidental flip of a switch um, or deliberate flip of a switch. But turning it off, you can have regurgitation through the LVAD. You can make someone's heart failure worse. You can have thrombosis and embolization of an LVAD. Um, you could have interference with intrinsic cardiac contractility. So if the aortic valve actually opens, it may interfere with the ability to eject. The aortic valve may not open. Um, and saying, let's explant. If you don't want your LVAD, let's explant it. Am I going to subject someone to a huge operation to take out a device? So turning off an LVAD is not without harm. It can make you worse. So it does introduce a new pathology into the setting of the pathophysiology of chronic heart failure. So consider this. This is a patient we had on our service this last year. 20-year-old man with an inherited cardiomyopathy since childhood. He came to us for options. With VT, and he was in shock. He had biventricular failure. He had pulmonary hypertension, profound cachexia, and frailty. When I first met him, he could not lift his head off the bed unless he physically picked it up with his, his hand and pulled his hair and lift, pulled his head off the bed. Um, his mother had died on a temporary LVAD. Um, and he was not a transplant candidate because of his frailty and his pulmonary hypertension and medical comorbidities. So after about six weeks of trying to improve his nutrition and get him to the point where he was up walking around with physical therapy, he, he did uh, improve his physical sort of protoplasm, he underwent an LVAD implantation as a bridge to transplant. Months later, he, one month later still in the ICU, and he now required a temporary RVAD because of hemodynamic instability. He went into basically incessant VT. In the interim, he had had bowel surgery because he'd had ischemic gut. It had an X-lap. Uh, no, nothing resected but an X-lap and unable to close uh, the fascia because of bowel edema. He had a tracheostomy for respiratory failure. He was on CVVH because of renal failure. Two weeks after this, we put an RVAD in. So he's now got biventricular support for supporting his heart. He's an incessant or intermittent VT. Doesn't matter. The VAD doesn't care. He's in renal failure still in CVVH. Respiratory failure. He's traked, intermittently requiring positive pressure ventilation. And he has essentially gut failure. Um, he was intolerant of two feeds uh, because of every time we tried to feed him, he would develop an ileus because of the metabolic burden of trying to digest food by his gut. So he was on TPN. He was interactive. He was mouthing words. He was speaking when he had his passing ear valve in. He was appropriate. Psych was seeing him to help with sort of his adjustment, I think also to help with everyone else's adjustment. And it was difficult, I think, for everyone taking care of this patient to go in the room to see him um, because he was being kept, he was, he was sustaining him. He was appropriate, initially very, very appropriate and aware of things and terrified and scared and wanting to, to continue with what he was doing. He was a 20-year-old young man. Um, but he had no end. There's no end to him. He's got bivad support. He's trached. He's on continuous CVVVH. 
there's no place for him to go ever outside an ICU. So, so what do you do? And he, he eventually started having alt, continued altered mental status and it was clear he was, you could argue it was clear a month ago that he was dying, but it was clear that he was dying. So we had a discussion um, with his father, who is his, his uh, decision maker, uh, to withdraw care. And the question came up how to do it with someone who was on so much support, physiologic support. And the father wanted to be home when his son died. He didn't want to be there. He'd spent enough time to bed, but he did not want to be there when his son died. Um, so the decision was made to turn off all possible alarms and change the, the device over from sort of direct current to battery and to let the batteries run out. That would take about 10 hours. So that happened. The father left the room. And then shortly after that, the batteries in the drive line were discontinued. Um, and he died within minutes. The father was still in the parking lot when his son died. So the question comes, how do you stop an LVAD? What's the best? Pardon? I, I'll go into that offline. Um, the question is the best way to stop an LVAD. You could silence the alarms. And I, I had hoped to get a, a, an audio of it. The, the alarms are alarms that you are not designed to sleep through. Okay, These are alarms that are designed to wake you up, wake up the neighbors, keep you alive. Right? These are alarms that are life-saving. So you can't silence them forever. You could silence some of them, but ultimately when you go to the low battery alarms, those batteries will, those alarms will keep on going. So you cannot continue to silence these alarms. So if you decide to silence alarms and switch to batteries, at some point 10 hours down the road, you're going to have alarms that are going to be pretty loud, pretty obnoxious, and really not conducive to a peaceful, calm passing into the, you know, the good silent night. Right? Or should you just turn off the power immediately? Disconnect, disconnect battery and drive line. What's the best way to do it? Patients will eventually succumb to their heart failure. Minutes, hours, sometimes days. Sometimes you turn it off and people manage to live four or five days without an LVAD, without power, without anticoagulation, with nothing. There's no, there's no programmatic set of, I'm going to turn you off and you're going to die within minutes. So what's the best way to think about it? So that's why I think we need preventative ethics. I think VADs are really a beautiful field where you really have to start talking about it early because of all of these, the nuances that are involved in taking care of these patients. Um, and what complications or what com comorbidities might prompt this, whether or not it's cancer, met, um, CVAs, pain, just inconvenience. Refer patients early. Now, the CMS mandated in October of last year that we have uh, palliative care involvement pre LVAD. Uh, implantation, which was great, and Charles Ree is now our sort of palliative care um, cardiologist, which is lovely for us. Um, and it's, it's really important when we think about when do we put in an LVAD. Um, just to end um, with a poem, this is a Carl Sandburg, you know, good Chicagoan poem, which I think is, speaks to this in some ways. I'm glad God saw death and gave death a job of taking care of all of us who are tired of living. When all the wheels in a clock are worn and slow and the connection's loose and the clock goes on ticking and telling the wrong time from hour to hour and people around the house joke about what a bum clock it is, how glad the clock is when the big junk man drives his wagon up to the house and puts his arm around the clock and says, you don't belong here. You've got to come along with me. How glad the clock is then when it feels the arms of the junk man close around it and carry it away. And this is just a, a, our team. Um, the LVAD team and the heart failure team. There's a lot of people who do this and a lot of people who, who are involved in trying to make thoughtful decisions about both when to put in a VAD and then importantly sometimes when to stop a VAD. Thank you. Similarities between hemodialysis and renal failure in here, and um, and use of LVADs. My qu there's many things I could ask about, but my question is related to whether there's, for lack of a better way of expressing it, a, a hierarchy of 
decisions. And thinking about the last patient you presented, you could have turned off the vent, you could have stopped the CVVHD. Um, so why was turning off the LVAD um, the, the decision that was made? And then the second part of my question is, is deciding to use a, an LVAD, whether it's a bridge to, to transplant or destination therapy, is that level of commitment then commit you to other life-sustaining therapies such as hemodialysis mm -hmm. or putting someone on a ventilator? So the first question, it's, we could have, and I think on him, I mean, at that point he was on trach call, he didn't need mechanical support, so that's, we'd already had the trach, you can't, I could plug it. Um, CVVH, you know, and we certainly do stop CVVH, the question is, I think it came down to one of time. And the question is, if you stop CVVH, again, people can tolerate not being on dialysis for a number of days, um, if not longer, especially with no sort of muscle mass. And I think the concern at that point with him was that the VAD being on was just prolonging things. And it was a question of if we stopped the VAD, we knew that he would die. And if we didn't, ultimately, the problem is with CVVH, you stop doing it, you go into VT, you get some volume overload. The VT doesn't matter because of the LVAD. So if he goes into a cardiac arrhythmia, it doesn't matter. And the volume overload, it would have taken him longer from a respiratory standpoint. So that by not turning off the VAD, by stopping those other things, we, we would have possibly made him worse, if that makes sense. Uh, I mean, we certainly try and do lesser aggressive actions first. If someone's on pressors and a, and a temporary LVAD, we'll stop the pressors first, things like that. Right. Right. Um, now, with respect to how much does it commit us for other therapies, uh, it's a great uh, question. And we tend to be a little bit more aggressive here about we will consider LVADs in people who are on renal replacement therapy if they're a bridge to transplant, for example. Um, I think in some ways, there are some patients we know are going to end up on temporary dialysis. And we're willing to have a discussion with patients about, yes, the likelihood of renal failure is this. It may or may not recover. Are you willing to accept that risk or not? I think it's also reasonable to have a discussion with patients saying, you know, if this happens, you may end up on renal replacement therapy, and there's no place that is by your house, wherever it is, that's going to take you with an LVAD and dialysis, and we're going to be left with the decision. Um, I don't think it obligates you to do that. Um, generally, in sort of the immediate perioperative period, we will accept a lot of risks up front. It's, the question is, how long you continue them, and that's a tough one because, I mean, as you know, renal failure can take six months to recover, but it can recover. Um, I rely on your crystal ball to help us with that. Oh. Oh. Okay. Hey, Sally. Sorry, sorry, I missed the beginning, but um, so I don't know if you covered. <laughs> covered this, but it seems like there's not a lot of good outcome data on what happens to people in LVADs. Like, what's what's the expected? Oh, so did you show? Did you show? Yeah, seventy percent uh, two years. Um, it's probably now about sixty-five percent five-year survival. I mean, there is associated morbidity, and you know, we current hospitalizations for heart failure. Um, aortic insufficiency. We're still trying to figure out how best to manage people with a VAD, but it can be a good quality longevity with the newer right. devices. Right, and, and part of the consent for getting the VAD, you don't discuss turning it off. That's not part of the procedure, I mean, at all. We are, so Charles is now involved in all of our patients pre-implant. Um, we have tried to address it before, not formally, and when I discuss, I mean, and I, I try, especially after the data I showed with Jim's study in the CCU about how abysmal we were doing about talking about um, even turning off ICDs, I try whenever I, I talk to a patient about an implant saying, we could make the decision at some point to turn it off. And whether or not you tell me, it's more important that you tell whoever's going to be making your decisions when to turn it off. Um, so that, you know, people have an intracranial bleed, that's probably the easiest one to say if you have an intracranial bleed and you're going to be vegetative, would you want to turn it off in that situation? 
Um, it's hard to come up with all the nuances of, of the complications because there's people who can have 10 GI bleeds in the first year and then after the first year something miraculously happens and they never have another GI bleed. Um, so it's tough to try and you know, figure out up front what's going to make them do it. It's, it's important to make them aware of these are complications that you're going to have. And at some point if the complications become too burdensome, we could talk about turning it off and just making it an open discussion. I don't know if Charles wants to comment. Actually, I did, you know, following up on that, just comment. You know, we're just starting up the involvement of palliative care in kind of pre-implantation evaluations. And one of the issues is really uh, dealing with preparedness planning. Um, you know, the problem is, question is how far do you push it? Like, we have a, actually a really good relationship with the entire team here, but, you know, at various conferences, I hear of suddenly more contentious um, relationships between the different groups in terms of even addressing those issues. Um, you know, there's the old fear that, you know, that oncologists had for a long time that, you know, oh, the palliative care physician is going to convince them not to get the procedure or something. And so, you know, that has always been kind of um, an issue we have to work around and work with the various teams. Um, you want some level of preparedness planning. Again, that's also time dependent. You know, when you have the Intermax ones coming in, crashing and burning, you don't really have time to address all of these potential scenarios um, and you know, talk about options like de discontinuation. That's why Savi had brought up the, the, you know, the point about putting in a temporary device with the hope that it will improve their mental status to the point that you can actually have a more meaningful conversation of the implications of a, a more durable device. But you know, these are still all issues that are, we're, we're learning. Just to follow up on Charles' point, what percent of new LBEDs are put in at the, uh, with the decision being made by surrogate rather than by the primary patient? And is that I don't think 25% or fewer? I don't think we have data um, on that as far as durable LBEDs. Certainly, you know, the ability to put in a temporary LBAD, I would say. 80% of those are probably made by a surrogate um, for, for the crash and burns, uh, eh, maybe, maybe a little high. I mean, there's certainly case, case published cases out there of a surrogate making the decision to put in a temporary device and then switch over even after two weeks to a durable device and then a patient two months later saying, turn it off. So there's certainly, there are certainly published cases out there of patients having, saying, I, you know, you made this decision for me, I don't want it anymore. But I don't think that's studied. I don't know. Gene, do you know if in the Intermax registry they capture that? I don't think so. Yes, please. Okay. You mentioned that this had a pretty high economic cost. Could you explicate a little bit more about what, say, the initial cost and the two-year cost typically would be both um, for insurance and out-of-pocket for the patients and their families? Um, so we don't. We actually vet insurance before we do these pretty carefully to make sure that it will not be... Um, it will be feasible for a family. Um, it's uh, the upfront cost for, let's say, in uh, HeartMate 2 is $240,000. Um, you know, it's insurance is approved. The biggest cost for patients at, once they get home is going to be the care, like the driveline care, the gauze, the gloves, the, that type of stuff. Because the medication really is, you know, warfarin and antihypertensive medicines um, and whatever else they have. So it really is just the... the the medical equipment, and they get batteries that are exchanged, you know, batteries last a year and then they'll get exchanged and that's covered by insurance. But the up, there was a cost analysis that was done comparing transplant and LVADs, for example, looking at the cost, the cost comparison. And it was a flawed study because they didn't take into account readmissions. So there's been nothing that looks at the cost, the comparative cost of a VAD versus a transplant if you assume that, let's say, a patient will get admitted once during their first year with a GI bleed and require an upper and lower endoscopy. And they will come in and require three extra echoes and also five right heart casts or whatever it is. So there's been no cost comparison in that way, but the cost of maintaining a person on a VAD is probably about $100,000, $120,000, which if you take it, the cost of dialysis now is about 80. So, you know, one and a half times more, what is the acceptable standard cost for quality of life for one year? 
Um, Tifu asked if, if we see it being covered by Medicare. So it's, I mean, it is, it is covered by, I mean, it is covered by Medicare now. Automatically as eligible. I, I don't think it'll go there. Um, in part, uh, first of all, the numbers are smaller, so financially it would not be as huge a burden. But if you take something just like saying that someone who meets the indication for an ICD, if everyone who met the indication for an ICD, which simple ICD, simple one lead is about $25,000, that would bankrupt our system. If you talk about taking you know, the 400,000 people, and may maybe they've done estimates about the need. The need are about 30 per 100,000 people would fit criteria for an LVAD. Big cities are doing like 2.8 per 100,000. Chicago's a big city. We do about 2.5 LVADs per 100,000 who are eligible for it. I don't think we're gonna get to a point um, where we say just because you have EF less than 25%, you're gonna get it. Um, I, I don't think with, with the new recognition of, of the complications and, and not only the complications, but the amount of people that it takes to care for these patients, that, that you can't quantify. Is that all because of cost? Um, it's not all because of, well, it's because of cost and also manpower. Um, I mean, our VAD coordinators are on 24-7 to take calls about, you know, different alarms, different bleeding, all these complications. The, the type of infrastructure you have to have, when someone goes home with an LVAD, we have to educate the fire department and the police department in their region so that they know what it is. You know, so they know what to do, so they know what the alarms mean, so they know if power goes out, someone's going to come and want to use their generator to recharge their batteries, these types of things. So I don't think we're going to get there. I don't think that's a bad thing that we're not going to get there. It is better than that. Can I quote you on that? <laughs> And dialysis increases your risk of getting heart failure by 23-fold. Dialysis 23-fold? Mm -hmm. Not causation, but association, absolutely. I, I, I've been struggling with this question that you alluded to in your presentation about whether some of the decision makers have the same moral standard as primary individual mm -hmm. himself or herself. And I thought I heard you say that the, the Baylor group and others have really questioned the standing of surrogate to make the positive call, that is the call to initiate long-term mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Did I Correct. understand that right? Because of the ramifications of living with an LVAD, because of the personal ramifications of living with an LVAD. That you was an instance when it appears that the surrogate doesn't exactly have the same claim rights mm -mm. or standing as the individual. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Can I find that paper? Mm -hmm. I'll find it here. Uh, any final questions? 